Welcome, AJ. How are you doing? I see you there. Are you? Have you unmuted Hi, yourself? Elizabeth. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. This Nico, is- what's up? What's up, man? How you doing? Good. Long time no see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm very, very honored to be here. Uh, this is such a, you know, an amazing moment in history, and we just all want Julian Assange free. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us, HA. And this is an interesting situation because I, uh, some, as some of the viewers here will know that I've always, me and Susie both have been interview, interviewed by you a number of times. So now the tables have turned and you're here with us. Thank you for joining us on this vigil. And just to start off, I'm, and I, I think I'm, I'm going to kind of broach this with every, every guest that we have on the vigil, is what is the importance and significance to you of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, not only in the sense of the amazing, effective scientific journalism that they've done, but also in the sense of Julian Assange's human rights. Um, if you could just give us some of your thoughts on both those subjects, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, you know, he publishes the truth. It's authentic, pristine documents. They're, they're authentic and pristine. And the truth is not partisan. It's just reality. It has no... Um, if the truth exposes left or right, what does it matter? It's actually what took place. So what Julian, the, the only sin of Julian Assange is that he told the truth. And in our world, people don't want to hear that. People want to hear whatever helps their side win. And when Julian Assange, uh, whether it's you know the Iraq war logs or Afghanistan or... You know, just in, I mean, how many countries in the world has he published? Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Russia. Um, he is a publisher. WikiLeaks is a publisher. The UK has actually ruled that they're a publisher. Uh, your media organization. Absolutely. Um, WikiLeaks emails have already been admissible in, in court in the UK. And actually, I just want to break in one moment there to give people a factoid about what you just that that sentence, which is that not only have they been admitted in court in the UK, but they've actually been cited in over 48,000 um, academic uh, papers and court cases. So the impact there is huge. No, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And um, so what do we have? Like We have the Washington. I always say like without Assange and WikiLeaks, all we're stuck with is the Washington Post. And exactly. I mean, you're doing amazing work, Elizabeth. I'm like, you know, in awe of the work you're doing at Disobedient Media. And what should take, what should be reality is that Disobedient Media and, of course, like WikiLeaks should be as big or as influential as the Washington Post, the New York Times, all of them. And actually, WikiLeaks is in, in many ways bigger than all of them. But what's taken place is that because they published pristine documents that don't um, adhere to a narrative or a spin or propaganda uh, blitz. They're not public relations documents. Actually, they expose, yeah, they expose the uh, shortcomings, the criminal behavior, the dirty underhanded uh, behavior of people in power. And in that's spun as, oh, well, he's working to help another country's interest because it's hurting the United States of America. Yes. So then we should never have any journalism in here because exactly. it, will, it would always just expose, you know, help another country hurt us in some Orwellian McCarthy era, you know, logic. So no, I mean, it, literally, it literally does translate into them being prosecuted and persecuted for doing the most effective journalism that happens in this day and age. That's what it is. It's really, really shocking. But yeah, no, I don't know what, if you have like uh, just some insight on that, on how, because I know that you've, uh, you've written for the Huffington Post, you've written for so long, you've been published in these outlets. So how is uh, WikiLeaks as a press outlet so uniquely effective? And how is that a part of their, the, them being persecuted so much and the hypocrisy there? Well, usually like when I used to write uh, for public, be, when I used to be published in publications that uh, were on the left, there is a um, an editor, and the editor has a um, an angle or a theme or some kind of political viewpoint they want to further. Um, and even I was published, I was a contributor in the Hill. It's more middle of the road, maybe you know 
somewhat more conservative than obviously the Huffington Post or Salon, but like there's always an editor, there's a, a mission statement for the publication or, uh, you know, there's, there's some kind of goal they want to achieve. Usually it's a political goal. With WikiLeaks, there's no political goal. It's just if the truth happens to expose the left or the right, it's just, you know, what they publish. Uh, but that's very dangerous. Exactly. And it's revolutionary. Yeah, it's re- it's absolutely revolutionary. I mean, now all we have is like anonymous sources, sources with not. So I have to trust these reporters or journalists at the Washington Post, New York Times. Ninety nine point nine percent are hardcore for one uh, political party. So it's like, obviously, they're not going to <laughs> they're not going to expose um the the overt propaganda of all of everything taking place because then it would hurt their first of all they wouldn't be published so the even if let's say they they decided to be like oh you know i want to be like elizabeth voss or susie dawson or julian assange or all these they would never be published and they might even be fired because if they kept on pitching ideas to their editor and it was always here let's expose the truth about people in power let's expose the truth here um, I'm not going to, you know, here's a whistleblower. They're at risk of their lives. You know, don't, don't give the identity to anybody. And, you know, you knowing this, because also with the Pentagon papers, what took place, I think after the Pentagon papers, these publications, the Washington post and other publications said, you know what, we're not going to take that risk anymore. And when Julian Assange, you know, came on to this, in the, in the world scene and, and started exposing the corrupt behavior of people. Um, that was very dangerous to a lot of, you know, really, really powerful entities and governments and uh, political figures. So they don't want, they don't want to know that Bernie was, you know, one political side does not want to know that Bernie was cheated. And they'll spin that into this grandiose theme of, Oh my God, you know, it's another country's, you know, so. No, I think that's completely correct. And I think that, um, so in light of that, in light of the way that there is always an agenda, and even if people don't think they have an agenda, they are still filtering that first, uh, the primary source material, if they even use an actual primary source of some kind or the words of somebody they actually uh, spoke to, they're still filtering that through their own, um, you know, lens. And as you've said, what we're seeing with the WikiLeaks publications is no filter no interpretation. It is simply the evidence left by the people that were creating uh, the the emails, the videos, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in your perspective, how has WikiLeaks um, affected your journalism? And, and in, in some way, would you be able, you think, to function as an independent journalist without WikiLeaks if you didn't have their evidence to cite in your reporting? Well, I think that WikiLeaks is like the last line of defense between an Orwellian society and um, the truth. You know, we don't have, it was CNN. It was kind of funny. CNN was like, uh, I forgot who it was. Some reporter there was like, Trump is attacking a free, a fair fair press. And I was like laughing, like what, you know, um, it's just, you know, it's just unbelievable that people don't realize that, the CNN and the Washington Post, the New York Times, MSNBC, all the pundits, they, they have a very overt agenda and it's not the truth. It's to further entertainment. See, a lot of it also is that there's no entertainment, there's no entertainment value necessarily for WikiLeaks and journalism has become synonymous with entertainment. So like right. MSNBC and CNN, I remember like when I was first, I, I, I've been on MSNBC a couple of times and CNN a bunch of times. And um, when I first went in the studio, I just remember like, it's just like this, um, like it was like a 1984 movie, like 50, 60, like flat screens everywhere with like, it looked like some kind of like casino in Vegas. Interesting. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, it's real. Like this is crazy. This is the machine. This is the media <laughs> machine. And it was you could tell that the number one goal was advertising and the number one goal was entertainment, not 
you know, some kind of like cerebral endeavor where, oh my God, you, you have to like look inward and say, oh no, we're really corrupt. We have to change. Like not, not, not real that. investigative journalism at yeah, all. Yeah, there's like, no investigative journal, even for like local papers now. I mean, that's like, that type of thing is gone. And when you look also like every major story, um, every major story, the journalist that breaks that story and it's unpopular is attacked. Nobody believes that journalist until finally, and they're discredited and they're, they're, um, and so many come to mind. I just can't remember like at this moment. Yeah. There are so many examples of that type of, of that exact, uh, story playing out. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and, and as, and as that journalist is trying to convey the truth, they're attacked by their colleagues, by the media, um, and instead of just, instead of Gary Webb is an example. So that's what I was looking for. Very good example. I believe WikiLeaks tweeted about Gary, Gary Webb, uh, recently saying something along the lines of it took eight years for the CIA and the press. I believe that was the tweet to kill Gary Webb. So if, if for people that are familiar, could you uh, give us a little bit of a background on that? Yeah, I mean, he broke the the story about the origins of crack cocaine and the CIA's involvement and in, in all of that, um, bringing bringing in um, you know cocaine into the country and into impoverished neighborhoods, um, which is a huge just, huge story. Huge. Yeah, this nefarious you know story where nobody was talking about it, and then of course the Washington Post. I'm just here at 2014. Gary Webb was no journalism hero. Despite what the kill the messenger, uh, what what kill the messenger says, you know, it's like they can't, they don't want to give any credit to anyone who um, destroys the the prevailing narrative. So this is a telegraph, though. In 1996, journalist Gar- Gary Webb began looking into links between Nicaragua's drug drug running contra rebels and the CIA, and how all of that. All of those drugs flowed into the the inner cities of our country, and um, the 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 CIA was involved. And this is the Intercept wrote a great article: how the CIA watched over the the destruction of Gary Webb. Uh, but here's he here's a here's a here's a journalist here's a man who, you know, he exposed the wrongdoing and the criminal behavior of our government. And so but we don't want to hear the the journalism nowadays is not about um, being intrepid. It's about following the herd. And if you follow the herd, you're good. If you're not, and it's like Julian Assange is like a, a Gary Webb on, an, on a global scale. So, I mean, in, in Gary Webb was like just this amazing, phenomenal journalist who really broke the mold. Um, and he exposed a story that, you know, that impacted millions of Americans. What Assange is doing has global impact, millions and millions of people throughout the planet. Because sources, WikiLeaks, they're publishers. They don't hack anywhere. They don't hack uh, computers. So that's exactly why every WikiLeaks document should be admissible in court. Absolutely. Very good you know, point. I mean, that's, that's, that's why would you not want evidence? That's the thing also. We don't even know what evidence means anymore. What they want to do, what they try to do also is they, they hide behind semantics. So they, they hide behind semantics and Orwell said that um, euphemisms were verbal refuse. So you see like, in my opinion, one political side more than the other, but uh, you'll, you'll see both political sides use euphemisms all the time. And if you look at one side, they'll be they'll their use of euphemism is like just omnipresent, like always they're always using some kind of phrase that's all encompassing and sweeping. And then, of course, they're blaming a country for their, uh, you know, inability to win. But it's like lost in all of this, uh, all these passions flowing around is the fact that here you have a man, Julian Assange, who's, it, it's, it's, there's such malice also. Like the UK is like, exactly. you know, doesn't even, won't even allow him freedom because of, the, uh, you know, some kind, not even a crime. 
because there was no case. The whole point was like, there's no it case was a, in Sweden well, the, ever. Yeah, there were no charges. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the details on that, there were never any charges against Julian Assange that were actually filed. And the investigation itself, um, the Swedish uh, authorities wanted to drop their investigation in 2013. And the UK pressured them not to, which was all revealed by the amazing journalist Stephanie Maruzzi. Her incredible work has been just, um, you know, I can't even express how important her work has been in, in showing us the way that uh, the persecution, persecution of Assange has not been normal. It hasn't been the, the average treatment of a journalist or a, just any person. So, but uh, eventually in 2017, the uh, Swedish uh, government and the authorities there did drop their investigation officially. So now he is uh, unable to leave in part because he will be, um, you know, picked up by the authorities, the UK authorities, no matter what. Period. Like the, there has been, there have been photographs published showing that he will absolutely be, um, you know, uh, arrested, no matter what the circumstances are that he, if if he were to leave the embassy. But nominally, it's supposed to be over a bail skipping, a bail skipping issue, which doesn't even relate to any charges and relates to an investigation that's now dropped. And so that's the context on that for all of anyone who do, who doesn't know. And it really, um, it has been very, very interesting to see. Um, in recent days, we've had Adam Schiff seem to admit that there is a giant um, apparatus that is hellbent in the US on arresting and prosecuting Julian Assange, which really reveals that the whole bail skipping issue and the whole Sweden case, all of that was just, you know, basically meaningless and a facade for the real prosecution that's going on behind the scenes. So I didn't mean to completely interrupt your thought, but I wanted to kind no. of like grab, you know, grab people's attention and give them some context on what, what you're mentioning and referring to. But continue, please. Yeah, no, I, I, that was that's I agree 100 percent. And also, like, I just want to touch. I want to emphasize that there's such malice. There's such like hate. And it's not it goes beyond petty. It's this uh, it's it's like this really unhealthy. Um, and th they think that attack let, just attacking the messenger. They think that that silences the message. But what it does is it actually amplifies the message. And it makes Assange, and I know he's suffering a great deal, and I know that he's experiencing such injustice, but it makes him more of a hero. What they try to do is they silence him and attack him and persecute him, but it makes him more of a hero. It, it emboldens and, and amplifies his voice louder than ever. And now you have people throughout the planet, millions of people who are constantly thinking, you know, okay, wh when is... What's going on with Julian Assange? When is he going to be free? Um, you know, and they know what's they know what's going on too. Like there's this vapid, childish, like pr like stupid attempt at oh well, you know, if we just you know cut his internet and if he can't speak anymore and you know then then suddenly the truth won't Exi yeah. won't be heard. But WikiLeaks is still around, and I mean what I always say, Elizabeth, is like I'm not like God forbid, like I'm not saying that this exists but people within the intelligence community or people who don't like julian assange they're pretty short-sighted and they lack wisdom because let's say there was a bizarre world julian assange like an evil an evil uh wikileaks that type of organization could you know actually be dangerous this organization wikileaks and julian assange they're just based on noble virtues. Okay, exactly. we want to go ahead. We have these sources. We're publishing well, actually, this information. Actually, um, earlier, John Kiyaki was talking about the CIA, and, and Susie pointed out that where uh, WikiLeaks is based on revealing the truth, the CIA is based on lies. And so if actually, in the bizarre world, world you're describing, the inversion of WikiLeaks would be the CIA, I think. And that's, exactly. that's an interesting point. Yeah. Exactly. And most Americans don't even, like, they can't even... They can't even explain what the how the CIA protects them. They have no idea how the CIA protects them. They have no idea how the NSA protects them. Uh, Americans don't really. And so when 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 you have like CNN or the Washington Post saying, "Oh, you know, this is a threat," how so? How is the truth a threat? The truth the truth is never a threat unless you have an, an agenda, and it hurts your agenda. Otherwise. 
you know, most sane and rational people would say, okay, well, if there's a problem, let's fix it. If our political system is not functioning correctly, let's try to make it more efficient or fair or equitable. Um, but we don't do that. We, we say, oh my God, you let us know how horrible one candidate was. So let's, we're going to try to sweep everything under the rug and say that it was some country's fault. Well, I think that I think that as well, in addition to that, you have an establishment, um, as, as we said multiple times in the stream, that really is a unified front that is not something that exists only in one political party or one one, you know, um, branch of government. It's a it's a very much a, a, a unified kind of um, unelected power structure. And the interesting thing to me is seeing how they have been a, this kind of naturally um, occurring structure has been able to operate for decades without being truly held accountable, as you're saying. They've been able to really get away with this. And so now they've become so dependent on their ability to control uh, press narratives, et cetera, that when you have something like WikiLeaks come up, you know, decades into their operation as, you know, sort of a uh, media controlling sort of unified front, it really truly goes at the heart of their ability to function and I think that that's goes to what you're saying for sure. And it, it it's, it's totally also, unprecedented. Yeah. And I agree with you. It goes at the heart of their ability to function, but see what they, what they're not looking at people in the intelligence community, they're short they're, or whatever. Let's just assume that whoever yeah. doesn't, yeah. Whoever doesn't like WikiLeaks or Assange in any country, not just the U S but they don't realize is that it's actually a good thing even if your intelligence uh, agencies are, you know, the raison d'être is to be secretive, it's actually a good thing for sources to have an outlet to then say, hey, you know, this is a lot of corruption here. You can yeah. keep like 98% of your corruption or 99%. We're just going to go ahead and inform the public of 1%. Can we get 1%? Can we get a yeah. half a percent? And so... Um, it's a good, healthy outlet. Like societies need WikiLeaks because like I said, the Washington Post, MSNBC, they, their goal is to sell ads and, and entertainment and you know, fabricate, foment this outrage for one side. It's very overt. Um, you do need that outlet in this day and age, especially in a digital world, in you know, this cyber world that we live in. If you try to silence that outlet, then God forbid, and I'm saying God forbid, because like, let's say there are people who are watching this and they're saying, oh, you know, H.A. Goodman is, you know, try, does he know something? No, I'm not. I'm looking into the future and I'm saying if, if it's just logical progression of thought, it's logical that if you deny and attack and try to silence a publication that publishes whistleblowers, then it's feasible another publication or another entity could rise up out of out of spite uh, because there's just such an overt malice when it comes to the UK or, you know, um, you know, so the secret grand jury, all of these things. Well, it really shows it reveal like their reaction to WikiLeaks, as you're saying, it reveals the hypocrisy of the liberal ideals that the West is supposed to have. So when we talk about freedom of the press and for, you know, democracy and all of these things, when they, when they attack uh, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, like you're saying, it really shows that those um, ideals are not something that we actually operate with. And that's um, unique, I think, in that type of that level of, of confirmation of that. But um, I, I was wondering, I wanted to get your thoughts on how you think things have progressed in the last two months. So, you know, unfortunately, we're going into the third month of Julian Assange being isolated. Have you seen um, a massive increase in support for Assange? What have been your thoughts on how this is all, the whole story has developed with this? Well, um, I wrote an article in the Daily Caller, Free Julian Assange, and I was very, very, very uh, honored to have WikiLeaks, but also extremely honored to have Mrs. Christine Assange share it. And... Um, I, I think that, you know, it, the, the, on the positive end, the people who really care about WikiLeaks and really care about Julian Assange and want him free, we're all emboldened. We have even greater purpose now. Unfortunately, on the other side of the equation, I do think that it's, I think that people who want him silenced feel this is a temporary victory for them. So I, I, yeah, and that's, I don't and then know, you see, maybe I'm just like a, you know, yeah. I, see the, I see the glass half empty, but I, I think that 
there are people who want to silence Assange and they see this as a temporary victory, but they're not, they don't, they, they lack the wisdom to realize that no, it's, you know, it's, it's only emboldened people who really care about Assange. Um, I, yeah. And I think that's why we see also like when you say it's emboldened the opposition to Assange, um, an example of that would definitely be those six uh, Guardian articles. And I think another another one or two was published recently where they're attempting to smear him. So, yeah, you do see kind of like um, uh, emboldening of both sides of that coin, I think. Yeah. Uh, it, it's also interesting. Why would you if you're the Guardian or if you're anyone, why, uh, you're, they're going to be next. They're too stupid to realize that. That is an important point, and that is something that has been touched on by WikiLeaks and by, a no- I believe, Stephanie and Marizzi, and a number of their legal uh, legal representatives have stated really clearly that what is happening to Assange and to WikiLeaks right now is is like a death knell of the ability of the free press to function, because if you prosecute a publisher who has done nothing wrong in terms of simply publishing information, then are you going to are you going to then prosecute the Washington Post for or the New York Times for publishing a leak? And John Kiriaki pointed out earlier that that they are that Washington runs on leaks. So yeah, I, I would love to get your perspective on that. Well, yeah, and also the these people are so stupid that when they when they try to attack Julian Assange, they don't realize that um, their publication would sell them out in like a, a nanosecond. They would be sold. They would before they could even step foot in the building. The Authorities would take them and arrest them and put them in jail if they ever actually, you know, came up with a story and had actual, you know, real sources about some kind of grandiose um, criminal wrongdoing uh, within within government. It's then that's not just the U.S. That's the U.K. too. And so, if Julian Assange, God forbid, is you know silenced, then the Guardian is next. The Washington Post is next because, in the event that they actually do want to engage in, you know, serious investigative journalism in the in the future, um, whomever is the next, let's say, you know, truth teller, a person who wants to publish something that nobody has the guts to publish, uh, it'll be a million times easier to make that person's life miserable. So they're pretty stupid too. Like these these journalists, what they don't realize, they they think. They think they're um, they're attacking like the negative qualities, or like I, I don't want to be too partisan, but what what I'm what I want to say is that like there are journalists who don't like WikiLeaks because they feel that WikiLeaks emboldens their um, political opposition, and then they assign all these qualities, uh, you know, these these attributes like racism and sexism, whatever, to that political opposition that they want to oppose. So because WikiLeaks published in this in, in the election emails that you know hurt their side, they then make the connection, oh, well, if I'm fighting WikiLeaks, then I'm also fighting, you know, Trump and whatever people that yeah. you know. And they, yeah. they associate so they're associating WikiLeaks with a political narrative that they want to push. Exactly. And that doesn't or, matter or they want to oppose. Oh, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so it doesn't matter if that if if that is a reversal of the narrative that was pushed against WikiLeaks the day before. Um, it, it you know it can it can oscillate back and forth about who who you attack you um, use WikiLeaks to attack in that type of narrative. But uh, and that's again I'll say it again. You know the unity in the fact that they are attacking Assange no matter what the publications that WikiLeaks publishes um, he is attacked constantly. And so that is why it is so important to have a unified front of supporters from all sides because we have to kind of reflect and we have to be the inverse of that um, unelected power structure that died in persecuting WikiLeaks. But um, can you can you speak at all about any of the ways that in general um, your investigative or independent journalism would not be able to have um, either been effective or wouldn't have been able to happen at all if WikiLeaks didn't exist? Because as an independent journalist also, I have noticed so many times that there are articles that disobedient media could not have published if WikiLeaks didn't exist because, and it covers a huge range of topics. So I I didn't know if you had any comments on that. Well, okay. Um, The DNC and Podesta emails influenced me a great deal uh, and they influenced my thought process. 
So just like, just like on, on Twitter right now, somebody was like, well, then why are you telling me to vote for this person? I'm, I'm not telling anyone to vote for anybody. You can do what you want. But knowing that Bernie Sanders was cheated and knowing the extent, uh, you had Nico House just on, uh, Nico yeah. and Jared Wonderful. and Elizabeth Beck. Yeah, uh, the DNC uh, took money, hundreds of millions. And this is important. Yeah, we, we wouldn't be having that conversation without WikiLeaks. Without WikiLeaks, that conversation would not exist. So, yeah, you can't like I would like to know if I'm being kicked in the face. I would like to know if, you know, I'm being stabbed in the back. I don't want to just like walk and stroll and be happy and oh, there's a dagger in my back. That's fantastic. I want to I want to know what's taking place and I also I want to know the nature of what's what's taking place in wars. I want to know, you know, the you know how if there are if there are people who within the CIA, for example, or within the military, whether it's Chelsea Manning or it's important or whether Edward Snowden, I want to know if, you know, James Clapper is lying or if John Brennan. I want to know if these people are lying because we pay their salaries. The whole point is, um, see, the intelligence community works for the American people. That's not that's lost in this. All of this. This is we don't owe anything to the CIA. The CIA owes something to us. They are supposed to Very, protect us. Exactly. And if they, um, and if they're yeah, go on. Oh no, I was gonna say I, I was just looking through some of the questions we've got uh, from the chat, and one that people brought up was when the day comes, what are Julian's options the day he leaves the embassy? And now we've talked about before. We know that he would it would depend on. I mean, I don't want to answer this for HA, but you know, we are aware that at this time there would only be one outcome and that would be his arrest. He does not have an option to leave the embassy right this minute, but I would still like to hear HA's opinion on, um, you know, options maybe if the situation changes and he's able to leave the embassy. I mean, you know, I think that if he ever did leave the embassy, it would be a situation where he's assured of freedom and he's assured that, you know, they're not going to try to take him to some kind of secret grand jury. So I'm assuming that, you know, his amazing, he has a brilliant legal team and, you know, he, I believe that he's going to, um, he, I believe Assange will be vindicated and that he will be successful because there's too much momentum in terms of the truth on his side. And it's really like, it's, it's not even, I don't even want to use the word childish because it's an insult to children. Like it's absurd that, we we know that they're just hurting him out of spite. We know that there's no charges against him. There are no charges. We know there's no case against him. Um, they're tr they're trying to imprison him within the the embassy uh, because of a minor infraction that is not even you know doesn't correlate to this kind of ongoing torture. And the the United Nations ruled in his favor. UK courts are ruling in his favor. So at the end of the day, I do think that the tables will, will turn. Um, there's just too much momentum in terms of truth. And um, there's, I think the best thing, like I always say, like for me, for me, I'm not saying for anyone else, uh, I'm not telling anyone else what to do, but for me, I'm not being partisan. I'm just saying I'm voting for Trump in 2020, but I would not. I would not vote for Trump if, God forbid, um, uh, uh, Julian was arrested and sent to the United States. Then I would oh, not, no. not, not if, vote. If that happened on the behest of, of Trump's administration or his DOJ, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It, I, it, that's yeah. the way you... Okay. Yeah, exactly. Well, and so uh, sort of um, moving on to a different question, because I'm just looking at the, the questions you've gotten from chat right now. And they asked... Uh, a, 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 question that doesn't go to what you were saying, but I think it's important to ask why, while you're here. And they said, what do you feel is the best way to promote an, the anti-war movement in the USA at this point? And I wanted to ask you that specifically because I know we're going to have a, lot, a number of guests that are from Australia or do not reside in the US. So I wanted to get your perspective as a journalist in the US on the, the state of the anti-war movement and how a real anti-war mo movement uh, can be built in the US now. Well... I can't really, I'm, 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 I don't want to be partisan, okay, too, too partisan, but I will say this. Um, in my humble view, in my humble view, there is really no anti-war movement in the United States of America. And sadly, there's more of an anti-war movement on the right than there is on the left. 
I've noticed that a lot of the organizations that popped up after the election that were, you know, deemed like pro Bernie Sanders or Jill Stein, they focus purely on domestic issues. And I never hear bring our soldiers home from war. I never hear end perpetual count, perpetual counterinsurgency wars or just perpetual wars. It, this is not what I've, what I've been actually told by many people is, you know what, who cares? Who cares? Look what he's doing or look at this or, you know, uh, there's other issues, the climate change. I had one very intelligent person, if you can believe this, one very intelligent person say to me, well, climate change will kill more, uh, more Americans or more people than wars. And in my head, I'm like, oh, my God, this is the extent of the anti. Like, there needs to be a movement of people that will not vote for a candidate if they are willing to send Americans overseas. I think that and, and unfortunately, there's there are more people on the right, in my view, than on the left who will take that vantage point. Um, but I don't yeah. see it. Yeah. That's an interesting I, recent phenomenon we've seen, the anti-war right uh, movement. And I, I, that's not partisan simply to observe that that has been kind of a phenomenon that we've witnessed. Um, well, the, do you think there yeah. would be any ways to encourage that to grow beyond partisan boundaries, you know, not not to have an anti-war left or an anti-war right, but to just have an anti-war movement? Do you think See, that's well, possible? So the, problem, the problem with is that there's too many euphemisms and labels used. So the rebuttal yeah. to that, I've been told by people, is that, well, they're not really anti-war. They're just isolationists. It's like, well, I don't oh, care yeah. what the word is. It really doesn't matter what your motivation is to, to advocate you bring soldiers home. Um, yes, it's, it's, it's just not – it doesn't do anyone any good to be overstretched and to constantly engage in wars throughout the world or to fund wars. Um, it makes the world less safe, but it also – um, creates a situation where we have veterans who have, you know, uh, given so much so in many, in many, many cases, their lives to the country, their families suffer. Um, you know, I've, I've spoken to veterans and they, they, they have night terrors, like some, you know, in their twenties or early thirties, like they have, they have these, like, you know, really they have, they can't sleep because of all the horrors that they've seen. So, but see, unfortunately, his, you know, history, historically, the, the left has been the anti-war uh, party or, mo mo you know, movement. Yeah. Uh, but now it's more so on the right, I, I say. So until the left, until Democrats say or until people on the left say we want to bring our soldiers home, we have no business being in these places forever. I don't think that there's going to be a viable anti-war movement. I mean, a, a viable. Yeah, and I, I think that that's a an important and um, you know realistic answer to that question. And that, then, thank you to whoever um, in the audience asked that. Um, what did, what are some of the ways that you think that the public, the people watching, uh, can tangibly help Assange and WikiLeaks um, beyond the normal sort of like you know donate sign petitions? Um, as a as a as a journalist, what do you think is the most effective way that people can actually make a difference? In this fight to reconnect Julian? Well, I think that, you know, um, just, you know, read the work of, you know, brilliant journalists like Susie Dawson and, and you and, and, you know, support WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. If you want to donate to them, if you want to write a letter to your congressman or write a letter to, I mean, they might, they're almost certainly not going to read it, but it doesn't matter. You, the more letters written, the more, um, you, you know, you, people should start writing on Medium their own Very thoughts. Um, they should go ahead and write their own thoughts. They should go ahead and um, be active with their own feelings. There's, you know, a really, really wonderful, um, there's a really, really wonderful um, um, person on, on Twitter. Her name's uh, Angel Fox and she's just great. You know, her hand, the handle, her handle is, is at uh, Angel Fox today. So but she's always writing and, you know, supporting. And there's a lot of supporters. Um, there's a lot of people who are, you know, finding creative ways. I know there's a WikiLeaks art. Um, there's WikiLeaks. Yeah, you can, you know, create yes. artwork. Yeah, I was going to jump in and say, yeah, that's something I mentioned right at the beginning of the stream uh, was that people should definitely take a look at Yara, Yara Spot art. And I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that handle correctly, but it's... Um, 
Y A R R A S P O T. So that account um, was photographing yesterday a, a number of um, you know pictures of graffiti and and repainted graffiti that she had. Um, uh, painted onto the, uh, a wall, and I believe Hosier Lane, I believe it's in Melbourne, but the, it's a um, really um, famous uh, uh, location for public art. And so what she had done is she had posted, uh, she had uh, painted, you know, Unity 4J, Free Julian Assange, and all of this information on the wall. And it was such a beautiful and inspiring, um, you know, show of support. And it just shows how with something as simple as a public wall and a paintbrush, you can get the message out there. And here, you know, you and I are speaking in the US, that that wall is in Australia, where, you know, the, the impact of these messages can be felt across the globe. And I think that that is um, you know, I, I hope that people do take into account their own talents and their own um, ability to make a difference that doesn't have to be journalism, it doesn't have to be writing, it can be painting, you can make a song, you can make an album, you know, whatever, you know, there you have to be creative and not let, um, you know, your the bounds of your own thinking limit your attempts. Or help. just like if, if you had a day or a week where thousands and thousands of Assange and WikiLeaks supporters would just constantly write poetry throughout on Twitter, just, you know, five, six poems a day for, you know, thousands and thousands of people, you would have this like, you know, cosmic, it would like cleanse Twitter of all the hate. <laughs> yeah. You know, it might, it might come close. Like Ghostbusters too. There's like slime and it's because of all this hate. I mean, Twitter is like full of this, this Definitely. negative, energy and if you would just if people could go ahead and like thousands of thousands millions of people who care about wikileaks just write poetry um a short poem on twitter i mean that's that a really would, good lesson to be positive and to to have that yeah. that message be purely positive i think that would be definitely really helpful and that's one thing that we're trying to do here too with this vigil is trying to just be supportive and positive in our you know discussion of of how to help if there's one thing that i could tell julian assange it, it would be that there are so there's so many millions of people who care about him and who love him and who care about him uh, or, or and then I should say that who admire his heroism and his courage. And of course, I mean, I can only imagine how much he's suffering and all, you know, all the, you know, every all the obstacles he's, he has to go through. But there is a movement of so of just millions of people throughout the world. Uh, whether it's organized or not, you know, I don't, but it, uh, there's just uh, so many people throughout the planet who want him free. And it's just, it's, there's not that, and it's, there's not many, there's not many examples in life and especially in politics where it's just good versus evil. I don't know of any, I mean, I get into arguments where like, no, this is a little bit more complicated, whatever, but this is good versus evil. This is just good. There's really nothing. There's only good. It, the truth is good, you know, and it's authentic too, because they don't say like, it would be one thing. It would be one thing if, if Julian and WikiLeaks edited or added something to the documents they published. I, mean, I completely agree. And I think that what you're saying, the black and whiteness of the, um, the kind of the, the good guy versus bad guy sort of situation comes from the fact, as you're saying, that they are just publishing the truth. And so then it becomes the people that are wanting to protect the lies are the ones that attack them. And that's why you have this really binary kind of um, situation. And that's also why it's so important for legacy press that when it acts as an extension of the state to demean and to mock and to smear WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, because that's the only way that they can diffuse their um, their support. So that's definitely something that's really important to note and, and take into account. Yeah. And, and, and also, like, they're not the Guardian or, you know, certain journalists here and there. They're not fooling anyone. Just because they yeah. think that the truth hurts their side, it's plain to see that it's doesn't hurt any specific side. It's just the truth. Maybe they should just look at their side and try to fix their side. So. No, but there has been no accountability um, from across the spectrum, like the people, the organizations, the individuals that have been shown to be corrupt or hypocritical 
almost universally do not sort of own up and take responsibility for their own actions. And that's, again, another reason that WikiLeaks is so attacked is because they don't want to take account of what they've done. They just want to end that truth being broadcasted. Exactly. Exactly. They don't want they, they don't want the truth being told. So they just, you know, they just want to, you know, put, you know, put their heads in the sand like an ostrich and, you know, um, <laughs> they, they just don't want to deal with reality. Um, there's also tremendous amount of groupthink, tremendous amount of people are afraid to think for themselves. And they're, they're even afraid also to like, like, like a tweet. It's gone so bad. Yeah, that the it's echo gone chambers, so- the echo yeah. chambers that divide people. That's definitely something this visual is attempting to kind of breach and break through, uh, because it's so, it's so, and you were saying earlier that um, you have pundits and journalists that, although they're they're supposed to be able to be sort of accessible universally, they end up speaking to a niche audience that that you know on, they only speak to that little group, and so that again goes along with this this factionalism, this echo chambers, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I mean, it, it's um, it's pretty unbelievable that in this day and age we only, we don't, there's, there, there really isn't a, there, there aren't many examples of good versus evil or truth versus people who want to hide the truth. Um, and I always like to think of it like in terms of if this is a movie, um, the good guys are not Brandon and Clapper and Comey and all these, you know, this is not, they're not going to be cast as the good guys. No, not the Washington post will not be like, you know, or CNN or the guardian, these people who are going against WikiLeaks now will not be cast uh, in a favorable light in the future. And that's what they lack vision. They, they, they completely lack vision because of that echo chamber and their allegiance to being, it's like this popularity contest. So, you know, the cool kids don't want, you know, the truth revealed about them. So they lash out. Um, but at the end of the day, look, truth, when you have this, amount of truth and really it's just everything they publish is authentic and pristine the interesting thing is also whenever um whenever politicians talk about wikileaks emails they never they never say that it's it's um not accurate they they never say they're not accurate they always they always they always focus on motive and you know trying to link some kind of conspiracy like they're the ones the conspiracy theory would be that oh well you know um, yeah. This fits. Or, it's, go on. Or, or or the or the journalist like uh, the one infamous time when uh, I uh, believe it's Cuomo who said you it's illegal to look yeah. at it. So they try to actually prevent you looking at it as opposed to even addressing what's in it. And yeah. and he's so confident too. Like this, you know, this is illegal. And it's like you're stupid. You it's not illegal it at us. all. Yeah. 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 And so and then it's you know these these hilarious. The Washington Post says democracy dies in darkness. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Meanwhile, the one publisher that's publishing light truth is trying to be, sti- you know, they're trying to stifle um, Assange and WikiLeaks. So, yeah, I mean, it's just so obvious. Yeah, and, uh, I think that's the, that's one of the unique things about WikiLeaks, too, is the way that it, it uh, in the reaction to them, the way that it has shown all of that hypocrisy and the depth of it and the way that it forces like Cuomo to make ridiculous statements like that. It's it's very, very. Well, CNN um, also botched the story about um, tr- WikiLeaks giving Trump Jr. emails before they were published. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah, that one. Yeah. And um it's just, uh, yeah, I mean, then, yeah, then you have journalists who attack WikiLeaks because they think that they're on the side of justice just simply because the truth was inconvenienced, in, inconvenient for them, so. Okay, and so um, do you have any thoughts on the, just the, just focusing on Assange as a human being, um, do you have any thoughts on on the human rights violations that are happening and and just kind of as we were just saying you know that this is happening to a journalist who is uniquely effective that they are being prosecuted like this like as a journalist how does that uh, strike you um how do you feel about that um etc i mean as a human being they're acting out of pure malice and hate and they're just trying to hurt him just for the sake of retribution this is about political retribution and they want to um they feel that the truth was a threat 
and uh, the truth undermined their chances to win. So, and then and then you get to the establishment, the current administration, and then there's like kind of a, a merging of the political party that's you know angry and 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 filled with hate, and then just just people within the government, the way they operate, you know, trying to just say, oh, well, you know, this is, you know, we have to keep secrecy. Meanwhile, <laughs> you have a secretary of state who's basically gave the whole country secrets everywhere in terms of cybersecurity. Um, but as a human being, I mean, I think it's re remarkable what he's accomplished. I mean, he's a, he's a global figure now. So, I mean, he's part of history. He's part of world history. So, I mean, he is a... He will forever be, um, and I do believe he's going to be vindicated, you know, soon. I, I believe he's going to win. I believe he'll be free. And the people who were on his side now will, you know, we were on the side of right. We were on the, we were on the side of justice. Uh, the people who attacked him, of course, will try to sheepishly, you know, say that, well, you know, they were always on Assange's side. Uh, yeah, meanwhile, you definitely see that. Yeah. When, when something becomes historically like you don't want to go near that that uh, situation that you supported at that time, you definitely see people kind of uh, minimizing their involvement. Jump on the bandwagon, yeah. Yeah, definitely. But uh, I mean, as a human being, I think he's a remarkable human being. I mean, to be able to do what he's to be able to uh, have accomplished what he's accomplished and continue to fight in battle. I mean, it's really I mean, it's not just, you know, getting knocked down. It's him getting back up and continuing to fight. I think it's a really amazing thing. Definitely. So. And the, the fact that he fights for us in that way, even, and I mean, uh, I believe he published a letter when he was a, a week or two, I think, into being gagged in this latest, um, you know, cutting off of his communications. He actually published a letter in support of journalists that I believe were missing in Ecuador and were later uh, found dead. And he was, you know, really fighting for people, even when he's in the most serious situation. So I think that, uh, a number of people point this out, but it's definitely important to reiterate that just as uh, Julian Assange fights for others, no matter what, we need to fight for him because he is acting in our interest. So absolutely, I agree a hundred percent. Absolutely, but, um, we have five minutes left of this segment. Are there any thoughts that you want to add, or that we haven't covered? Any issues about around WikiLeaks that you think are important to raise for the audience? Well, I just am honored to be here uh, like I was for the first vigil. And um, I just think that, uh, you know, without WikiLeaks, we're stuck with and, you know, a, a media that is beholden to advertising dollars and entertainment. They not, they're not focused on truth. They're not focused on um, pristine documents. They are just focused on hearsay and gossip. Everything that, not to get too, you know, deep into it and partisan, but everything that we've, we're seeing now is based on hearsay, gossip, innuendo, suspicion, no evidence, you know, it, but, and that's why I believe WikiLeaks, uh, well, you, the UK has already ruled that WikiLeaks emails are admissible in court. So what better example of evidence than, you know, pristine documents? Absolutely. And I think it's and and I think earlier we rent we you mentioned that um, he had had a number of decisions uh, in his favor from the UN and I just want to specify I believe it was the United Nations Working Group on Ar Arbitrary Detention I may have bungled part of that but basically it's a really well respected body within the UN and he has had I believe two rulings that have shown um, that he is in arbitrary he's he is being arbitrary arbitrarily detained and uh, so that's a really serious situation and. Thank you, H.A., for joining us. It's been an amazing time talking to you. And uh, I, you know, I, I want to emphasize again how amazing it is to have all of these journalists, activists, whistleblowers from completely different backgrounds coming here to unite for Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. Um, and I know that a lot of our viewers will know what your YouTube and uh, Twitter handles, et cetera, are. But if you want to just let people know where they can find you. Yeah, if you type in H.A. Goodman on YouTube, you can find my channel. And then it's at H.A. Goodman Author on Twitter. And uh, I'm just honored to be here. And uh, just thank you so much for this discussion. And I know that we all want Julian Assange. And I do believe he's going to be free and victorious.